before I start, I want to point out that um, what I'm presenting today is, uh, is on behalf of a very large task force that has formed at Penn uh, just a couple of months ago in order to make this large-scale SARS-CoV-2 testing a reality for us. Um, before I show you about some of the solutions that, that has been developed by this uh, outstanding team of, of various groups with very different expertise, I want to remind you um, of the necessity, not only the necessity, but also the challenges we have in, uh, in developing uh, such a tool for large-scale population surveillance here. Um, and we've, we've, over the course of the day, we've seen these points uh, come up multiple times. The first one is that by now we have a pretty good sense um, that a lot of the transmission happens during the asymptomatic stage, um, which means that uh, regardless of which epidemiological model you use, um, we're pretty confident that in the large majority of individuals, the, the transmission starts before the onset of symptoms, which of course for us um, poses the challenge of having to um, move to asymptomatic testing very rapidly if we want to get this under control at much earlier stages than we, we can currently do. So this was one of the first uh, papers that came out on this topic. It has now been confirmed uh, um, by multiple follow-up studies as well. Another point I want to make here is that um, from the same study, it became apparent, and, and again, this has been confirmed by multiple follow-up studies as well, um, that actually the, the day of symptom onset is usually the day of, of the highest viral load. Um, so we basically, once, once a patient develops symptoms, we have a, a continuous decline in the CT value or in viral load that we can detect. Um, again, arguing for the need to, to test very rapidly and, and before the onset of symptoms. The other thing that's, uh, that's becoming apparent here on this graph is that um, there is no apparent distinction between mild and severe cases, even though this was a relatively small study at the time, um, but this has also been confirmed in, in, fall, in subsequent studies that we can, just by viral load itself, we can hardly distinguish between severe cases and mild cases. The second challenge we have, and, and this might even be a, a stronger one compared to this one, is uh, the phenomenon of overdispersion, or the fact that um, R0 in this case is actually a composite of very asymmetric spread in the in the community. Um, you can see here in the schematic, which was actually uh, coming from the first SARS epidemic in 2003, um, where we had a very similar phenomenon, where there was uh, the large majority of infected individuals did not go on to infect other people, um, but the large majority of infection events actually came from a very few super spreading events. And it seems like in the current uh, SARS-2 pandemic, this is exactly the same case. Um, which for us as, as developers of a um, population surveillance tool means that it's not sufficient to do sporadic asymptomatic, asymptomatic testing um, because we might miss these uh, potential super spreading events, but we would actually have to test uh, person by person. And then the third challenge um, is of course the, the sheer uh, scale of the, of the population and the population size that is susceptible. Uh, we heard earlier today from, from Scott that very few individuals have pre-existing antibodies from, from prior coronavirus infections. Um, so theoretically, the entire population is our target population here and is, is uh, theoretically susceptible to transmission. And if we just uh, look at the numbers here at Penn, um, we're talking about, at full capacity, we're talking about uh, 40,000 individuals that would be on campus, um, consisting of about uh, 5,000 faculty and staff, 10,000 undergrads, and a little bit over 10,000 uh, PhD student, postdocs, uh, researchers, and hub employees. So while this is just a ballpark estimate, um, it clearly emphasizes that if we now come back to the first two challenges, and we really want to test, first of all, person by person, and, and second of all, uh, during the asymptomatic phase, um, we would need to, uh, to have a goal of 8,000 individuals um, tested per day if we wanted to test all of these 40,000 individuals per week. Um, which, of course, um, following Peach's talk, uh, is, is greatly exceeding the current capacity, especially because here we're only talking about asymptomatic individuals. So what we tried to do when we came together as this uh, rapid assay task force is to develop solutions to these challenges in, in trying to um, enable this uh, as the ultimate goal of being able to test 8,000 individuals per day. So what we did over the last few months in, in these uh, many groups that are involved in this project is to, to go through each um, method that is available um, and to break down the process into collection, amplification, and detection, because these are the essential components of any uh, diagnostic test that we would want to run. Um, we've already heard a lot today about uh, the nasopharyngeal swap as being the number one collection tool. 
Um, the downside of this is, of course, that not only are these uh, swabs uh, not available in unlimited supply, but it's also um, very unrealistic in terms of um, in terms of uh, personnel that is required to test um, 8,000 individuals a day. Um, to say nothing about the discomfort um, that that uh, the population experiences if they had to be tested uh, once a week by a nasopharyngeal swab. Um, fortunately, over the last few months, it has become apparent that saliva may be um, a comparable analyte in terms of sensitivity. Um, this is data from Gale, and, and we've confirmed this in our own hands to, to see that uh, the saliva performs on par uh, with a nasopharyngeal swab, at least in terms of uh, our ability to detect viral copies. Then in terms of amplification, um, the, the standard assay uses qPCR. We've been looking into an alternative, um, which is called LAMP, or loop-mediated isothermal amplification. Um, the benefit of this is that, as the name suggests, it can be done at a constant temperature um, and could theoretically be performed at very large scale just using an oven instead of a, a thermocycler. And then finally, for detection, um, we've been comparing the standard fluorescence readout um, lateral flow devices, which are relatively expensive um, per assay, as well as sequencing, which I will highlight in, in just a minute. Um, so, so we've gone through many iterations as part of the task force um, in, in trying to optimize these various assays and combinations of those modules. Um, and I'll show you um, in a couple of slides how the assay performs if we're using saliva as an analyte and we're, we're looking at um, lamp sequencing or, or lamp amplification and then potentially coupled to sequencing. So first of all, this is how the assay looks like. Um, we're targeting um, multiple different genes. Um, here I'm showing you the N gene and the ORF1A gene of the virus in, in multiple dilutions. You can see that the assay is relatively sensitive. Um, and I should point out that this is without the need um, for, uh, for purifying uh, nucleic acid from the saliva. So this is on straight on saliva. Um, we're doing a few tricks to, uh, to get rid of the viscosity of the saliva, um, but, but basically we can detect uh, the viral gene in, in multiple uh, multiple regions of the genome, and uh, the negative controls are flatline. And RNASP is um, our internal control, picking up a, a human gene to validate this, that the assay works. And here, only the water controls are flatline. So, in terms of sensitivity, I, I think we can we can be confident that we can pick up uh, virally infected samples, and we have internal controls um, of the human gene for those samples that are of poor quality. So the, the pipeline that we've come up is basically starts with uh, self-collection of saliva. Um, and then an individual will transfer this uh, saliva um, into inactivation solution, which uh, is, is designed to deactivate the virus um, upon heating, um, as well as taking care of the viscosity of the sample. Um, this follows a protocol that was initially developed by the SEPCO lab, and, and Sarah Cherry validated the, uh, the uh, um, effectivity of inactivation at BSL-3. Um, then, with the help of robotics, we're transferring these analytes into the RT lamp mix um, and can read out in a standard qPCR machine using fluorescence, um, just um, like like the graphs that I've just shown you. Now, the advantage of this is that the procedure is very rapid. The RT lamp reaction um, takes less than an hour. It's really inexpensive on a per sample level, um, primarily because this is uh, it, it involves relatively low. Uh, um, labor intensity for, for uh, individual people to run this assay. And then it enables us to identify individuals for the clinical test. So this is not to replace the standard qPCR assay, um, but it enables us to go in and identify potentially infected individuals from this very large population and nominate them for the clinical test, um, which will then potentially lead to uh, quarantine. Um, now, with this setup, um, which we're currently establishing, is it, we can we can easily test a thousand samples per day just uh, using this plate format and, and qPCR readouts. But we're still a little bit far away from uh, from the eight thousand individuals, which is our ultimate goal. Um, if we were to test everybody on campus every week, so we've been thinking about strategies to to scale this up even further and to reach even larger scale um, population surveillance testing. And to this uh, to this end, we were inspired by um, a technology that has first been proposed by Jonathan Schmidtburg, which is basically using the trick of barcoding the primers that are used for lamp amplification. So we can we can barcode these primers, and then uh, the, the product, the, the amplification product, will be barcoded as well, um, which we can then use to pool um, all the reactions into a single tube and perform uh, amplification for sequencing. Um, which not only allows us to pool at very large scale, but it also allows us to directly detect 
the product um, with very high sensitivity and, and, uh, and no risk for, uh, for background amplification. And then if we implement this into the pipeline, it will basically, instead of using uh, fluorescence readout, we can, uh, as I said, pull the entire uh, reaction of RT lamp um, amplicons into a single tube and sequence them. And then, of course, we're talking about um, a very high throughput at relatively low labor intensity because everything can be done in a single tube, at least the final step. Um, and we can couple this to very large population surveillance strategies. Um, which we can then not only do on campus, but potentially extend beyond campus into the community, um, given the sequencing power we have here at Penn and the fact that we can, um, in a, into a single reaction, we can easily pool 10,000 samples, um, assuming that the, the rate of positive individuals will be around 1% or lower, um, which we can then still sufficiently detect by achieving uh, 100 million reads per sequencing run or more. So with this, I'd, I'd like to stop here. I'm looking forward to the discussion, but I want to again highlight um, the many groups and individuals that were involved in this effort, um, including all the labs that are listed here that have been part of the, the rapid testing task force, as well as its implementation as we go forward to inviting the community um, to, to donate uh, saliva samples for testing, um, along with the individuals that have been very helpful in robotics development, and from my lab, uh, this effort has been spearheaded by, by Patrick Lundgren, who has been running many optimizations of the asset that I've shown you uh, over the last few months.